Welcome to the Institute of Catholic Culture, a nonprofit Catholic organization dedicated to the re-evangelization of our society through educational and cultural programs offered to the public at no charge. This and other presentations, hundreds of hours of audio, are available for free on our website, www.instituteofcatholicculture.org. There you can listen to or download educational programs related to all aspects of our divine faith and review our schedule of upcoming events. We hope you can join us in person. The Ancient Church, presented by the Institute of Catholic Culture, is a four-part series on the history of the Church in the first millennium. Our speaker, Steve Weidenkopf, is a lecturer at Christendom College's Notre Dame Graduate School in Alexandria, Virginia, and he's the author of Epic, A Journey Through Church History. His 20-part epic study is available at his website, www.catholictimeline.com. In part four of this four-part series on the history of the ancient church, Steve introduces us to the age of monks and missionaries when the faith was preserved in monasteries and spread to distant lands by Pope St. Gregory the Great, St. Benedict, St. Patrick, St. Boniface, and others. If you'd like to follow along, the slideshow Steve refers to is available on the audio portion of our website. We hope you enjoy this presentation from the Institute of Catholic Culture. And again, please visit our website, www.instituteofcatholicculture.org, where you'll find the best in Catholic education available to the public at no charge. And to those that are donors uh, to the Institute of Catholic Culture, I do want to thank you very much. We were just able to purchase a vehicle for the Institute, my, my sad old van that had been given to me for free uh, about two years ago uh, was on its last legs, and it was going to cost $500 to pass inspection. And, uh, and uh, so we, we made the, the sacrifice necessary to, to, uh, to purchase a van. Uh, which was badly needed, and um, so I'm very thankful for that. The salesman, by the way, uh, his name was Moses, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he's from Ghana. And I said, now, wait a minute, you're from Ghana. Your parents were Catholic. He says, no, my parents were Pentecostal. I says, okay, your grandparents were Catholic. He says, okay, yes, they were, because, uh, of course, the Pentecostals went in and, and wreaked havoc among groups that had been Catholic for many, many, many years, as they still do today in places like Russia, Jerusalem, and other places. So anyways, I said, I, we were test driving the van, and I turned around. I said, okay, we'll buy it right now, Moses, if you become a Catholic. <laughs> and uh, he said, okay. <laughs> so Henry pulled out the holy water. We baptized him right there. <laughs> No, I'm kidding. But, uh, but I did. I said, now, now, hold on, Moses. I'm going to make you a Catholic, but uh, you've got to promise me that if we buy this van, you're going to come to church with me. And he said he would. So he's going to come on Pentecost to church with me and uh, he'll bring his family too. Yeah. So please pray for Moses <laughs> and pray for me. Uh, please welcome Steve Weinkampf right. back. Yeah, I got that place. All right. Thank you, Sabatino. You know, Sabatino was telling the story about buying his van, and um, he was talking about Moses being the salesperson. I thought to myself, so if I'm thinking about this in terms of Old Testament and the Scripture and the stories, and you have Moses, and I was trying to, if Moses, the salesman, was Moses, then who would Sabatino be in that story? <laughs> and I was thinking to myself, maybe he'd be Aaron. Um, you know, but then I thought, well, he's not buying a golden calf. Instead, he's buying a car, so that obviously wouldn't be it. But... Um, so a little scripture humor, I was trying. <laughs> so this is our final time here, right? We're talking, uh, this is our last presentation on the ancient church. We're going to take us up to the year 1000 or a little before the year 1000 today. So um, just as a brief review from last week, we were in our time period, if you remember, of conversion and councils. And there were a couple main things that were going on, main events that were going on during that time period in church history that we talked about. Well, or two of them were those conversions that I mentioned. There was one that happened at the beginning of our time period, and that was the conversion of the Roman Empire. That institution, that government, that, that uh, you know, uh, nation, if you will, that had once civilization, that had once persecuted the church, now actually adopts and, and favors the church 
and people will come, you know, more and more people are becoming Catholic, and so the persecutions end, and the church is now kind of above ground, and we see the interaction now that the church has with that Roman government. We saw how the Emperor Constantine comes into the picture and begins to try to actually control the church and rule the church, and how that would really affect church history in the East, and we talked about that a little bit last week. We saw, too, how that after the church had, had now, uh, had been, the faith had been embraced by the empire, we had the arise, arriving of heresies, you know, on a much larger scale than before. We had talked in our second time about the time period of persecution when there actually were some early heresies that the church had to deal with, but on a much more kind of localized internal scale. Now it's a much larger scale. We saw that heresy of Arianism really kind of take root and grow in many regions of, of the empire. And that caused a huge problem for the church and even for Constantine, who wanted to, the church to be a source of uh, unity, really, in the, in the empire. And so there's a lot of disunity because of the conflict over this, this uh, heretical teaching of Arius. So we, he, we call the Council of Nicaea, and we looked at that council and how the council fathers gathered together, and they produced the creed, which we still... You know, say in part today, and actually remember I said it was the creed we say at Mass today is really comprised from two different councils, the first two councils, Council of Nicaea and Council of Constantinople. Then we also looked at the beginning of monasticism. We saw how in the time of persecution, we had what's known as, you know, red martyrdom. People, Christians actually shedding their blood, their blood for the faith in violent ways and dying for the faith. And now that the faith is legalized and is tolerated in Roman society, there's no more actual death necessarily um, by believing in Christ and being a member of the church. Now instead people begin to embrace this white martyrdom of monasticism, of separating themselves from the world and going into the desert so they could be closer to God and spend more time with him. And we saw how at first it was more kind of an eremitical life or hermits, people living, living individually, but then there were, you know, other people would be attracted to those hermits and so a small kind of proto-community uh, would develop. And we'll see monasticism flower even more uh, into what we consider and what we think of monasticism when we talk about tonight when we talk about St. Benedict and the Benedictines. And then we looked at um, another council of the church, the Council of Ephesus, dealing with another heresy over the role of Mary and what her role is in the economy of salvation. And we saw two, um, we looked at one great pope, or the first pope to be actually given the title of the great, uh, which we had to talk about since we're meeting in the church named after him, right? Pope St. Leo the Great. So we looked at him, and then we saw how the empire in the West, the Roman Empire in the West, collapsed in the year 476 when a Gothic German chieftain by the name of Odo Acker came down to Rome and deposed the last Roman emperor and declared himself king of the Romans. And so now we have the Western Empire, kind of the central government authority in the West collapsed. In the East... It's still there, it's still vibrant, it continues all the way up until the 15th century, as I mentioned, when the Ottoman Turks come in and they conquer Constantinople in 1453. And then we ended our time period with the last conversion I mentioned that was very, very important in the history of the church, and that's the conversion of the Frankish king Clovis. And we have the Franks, who at the time were, were the kind of a large pagan tribe, uh, who come into the faith through the actions of a great woman in church history, St. Clotilda. And she was married to Clovis, king of the Franks, and through her efforts and through her prayer, then the Franks, Clovis converts along with his warriors, and the tribe becomes Catholic. And that was very important because there were many other German tribes which had embraced a form of the Christian faith, but it was a heretical form. Many of the other German tribes had embraced Arianism because many of the bishops in the East who were Arian had sent missionaries to the Germans in the West, and they had been uh, converted to this, this uh, you know, perverted form of the faith, if you will. So it was very, very important for the Franks, and we'll see that even more important tonight when we talk about Charlemagne and the kingdom of the Franks and the very important relationship that the Franks had with the, with the Holy Father, particularly in Rome, and then um, you know, we'll see that relationship continue with the church later on. So we're in our time period tonight, what I like to call missionaries and the emperor. And so this is a period that I've colored, I've given the color purple to because it, it's a sense of, that's a color of royalty. And this is when we're talking, we're going to talk about the, the Emperor Charlemagne and his role in church history and his role in Western civilization. So the main theme that is kind of operating in this time period from the year 500 to right before the year 1000 is that this is a difficult time for the church and a difficult time for Western civilization as a whole. We'll see a little bit how the papacy is under attack by secular rulers. What happens in Rome and in, in Italy is that you have the rising of these little kind of local German or ethnic German chieftains. So we see, we'll see the papacy becomes under attack, and actually what we'll see is we'll see a lot of local kind of Roman tribes, or Roman nobility really, different Roman families, will vie with each other to try to control the papacy. 
And so this is, even now at this point, so many people kind of think of the papacy and the problems that it had politically for later on in the Middle Ages, you know, like in the 14th century or in the 15th century even. But even here, you know, starting in the 8th and 9th and even 10th centuries, we have problems in the papacy with, with independent secular rulers trying to control the church by trying to appoint who they want to be pope. And that causes a lot of problems in the church. We'll see also in this time period, we'll talk about it tonight briefly, the rise of a movement which greatly affects the church, greatly affects Western civilization, and still impacts severely our civilization today, and that's the growth of the movement of Islam. So we'll talk a little bit about that tonight. And then, but, you know, although this is a dark time, we can say, in church history, there really is some bright lights. And one of the bright lights, or the main bright light, really, is this, are these missionaries, these men who go forth and bring the faith to areas that either had received the faith in a perverted form through Arianism or areas that had never received the faith before. And we'll talk about one missionary in particular that does that. And we'll see how, you know, the, the Western civilization really kind of grafts itself again to the faith uh, to the Orthodox faith as a result of these missionary efforts. And so one of the great missionaries, I think, during this time period, although we don't necessarily think of him as a missionary, is uh, the saint, St. Benedict of Nursia. Now, St. Benedict is known as the father of Western monasticism because in the year 530, he founds the, the monastery of Monte Cassino. All right. And so he also had a sister, most of us are familiar with this story, his sister is St. Scholastica. She also founded religious communities for women. What, what's, important to sound, what's important about St. Benedict is St. Benedict wrote a rule for his community. And his rule that would govern his monastic community had a couple of different main points, uh, really two that are very, very important. One is that he had as, as leader of this community a person who, who would go, went by the title of abbot. And the abbot was the head of this monastery and the head of these monks in the community. And this abbot was called by St. Benedict to be a servant leader, someone who would act and lead in an imitation of Christ, not somebody who would lord over or rule over the monks, but rather someone who would lead them as a servant leader as Christ kind of led the apostles, one who gave his life for others in its servant type of role. The other important point to Benedict's rule is that it, his rule provided an organized and structured way of life for his monks. An organized and structured way of life for his monks. And really the whole Benedictine uh, model, the whole Benedictine lifestyle is based on the Latin phrase, we could, what's known in Latin as ora et labora, prayer and work, prayer and work. That's what the Benedictine monks, their entire life, their entire day, hours of every day were scheduled for either work or prayer. Now, why that's important is at this time in Western civilization history, with the collapse of, Western, of, of the Western Roman Empire and the central authority and central government in, in Rome, really authority, political authority, and any kind of organized life devalued down to the local level. And in many cases, there really was no organization, there was no structure, there was no real government. And so you had in these places with Benedict and where his men, his monks then went and founded other monasteries throughout Europe and took his rule, they then brought this sense of organization and structure to a world that was very chaotic. You know, and we can see, I mean, we live in a very ordered and structured life, right? Our modern world is extremely ordered, extremely structured. I mean, could you imagine if we lived in a world that really had no kind of form of government? There was no structure really to our day. There was no organization to it. There was no kind of, you know, defining um, institution. It would be just, it would be chaotic. I mean, it would be very disconcerting for most people, right? For most of, I like order, I'm German, so I like order <laughs> and structure. And in the absence of order and structure, I don't do too well, all right? So for me, St. Benedict and his monasteries would be a bright light in this kind of dark time in the history of the church, in the history of, of, of the area, the history of the region, because they provided this organized structure and way of life. And it wasn't just in one area, you know, the monasteries, these Benedictine monasteries, grew rapidly throughout Europe. Now, the other thing that these monasteries did that really um, served as a, as a great um, you know, uh, aid to Western civilization is these monks, part of their work was not only manual labor, but they also copied manuscripts. And we'll see this even more when we talk about Charlemagne. And Charlemagne used the Benedictine monks in particular to, to further um, his, his renaissance, what's known as the Carolingian Renaissance during his time frame, where he had them copy all kinds of classical manuscripts, you know, writings, ancient writings from Greek and Roman authors. And so we have really the whole corpus of literature that we have in the Western world is the whole reason why we have those copies or we know about these works from you know, Cicero and others and Aristotle is through really the copying and even the scriptures, the copying of these works by these Benedictine monks. If they didn't do this work, then those works 
probably would have been lost for all of you know, time. And so it's very, very important work that they offer to Western civilization. Now, we know an awful lot about St. Benedict because his um, biography, or biography of him was written by the second pope to be given the title of the Great in the history of the church, Pope St. Gregory the Great. Now, St. Gregory the Great is known as the Great for many different things, but one, one thing he's known, why he's called the Great, is because he really defended the church and the papacy against secular rulers who wanted to try to control the papacy. He kept the papacy independent during his time. He also built up the city of Rome and tried to you know, provide an organized form of government for the citizens of Rome. He is the first pope to take the title Servus Servorum Dei, or Servant of the Servants of God. So if you want to know where that title of the pope comes from, it comes all the way back here to the time of St. Gregory the Great. Now, St. Gregory the Great is also really known for his missionary efforts. And there's a fabulous, wonderful story that's told of St. Gregory, that while before he was pope, he was walking through the slave markets of Rome with a friend, with a companion. And he goes to the slave markets, and he sees this group of fair-skinned, you know, uh, light-haired youths that he had never seen before, different, you know, different people, blue eyes, fair skin, blonde hair, never seen these type of people before, a very un-Mediterranean complex and complexion. So he looks at them, he looks at his friend and he says, he asks his friend, you know, who are these people, who are these, these youths? And his friend looks at him and says, oh, they're Angles. And if you know anything of your history, you know that, that the, there's a Germanic, ethnic Germanic tribes known as the Angles, the Saxons, and the Utes. And the Angles, the Saxons, and the Utes leave the continent of Europe, and they migrate to what today is known as England or Britain. And they come into contact with the Celts and those native peoples of England. And ultimately, then, they overrun the, you know, the country, and they overrun the Celts, and they become more numerous than the Celts. And that's where we get the whole Anglo-Saxon you know, aspect of culture and of heritage, right, from these ethnic German tribes that, that migrated into England. And so these, tr these uh, youths that he saw in the slave market were members of the tribe of the Angles. And so his friend tells him, oh, these are Angles. And so Gregory looks at, him, uh, looks at them and he says, he looks at his friend and he says, no, not Angles, but angels because of their complexion. He says, how sad it is that beings with such bright faces should be slaves of the prince of darkness when they should be co-heirs with the angels in heaven. And he vowed, this is before he became pope, and he vowed that if he ever had the opportunity to send missionaries to that region of the world, that he would do so. Because a people so fair in complexion, and you know, who don't have the light of Christ, should be given that opportunity to embrace Christ and embrace the church. And that's what he did when he became pope. He sent in the year 597 St. Augustine of Canterbury and 40 monks to England to mission to the Anglo-Saxons there. And it's, it's recorded that St. Augustine met with great favor, great missionary, his eff missionary efforts were well received. And on Christmas Day of the year 597, he baptized 10,000 members of one tribe. So here we have this great flourishing of the, of the church in England. Now, the faith had existed in England before, but it really had fallen away in a certain sense because of what was going on in Europe. But now, once again, we have the faith coming back to England, being revitalized through the missionary efforts of St. Gregory the Great. The other thing that St. Gregory did that was very important is that while St. Augustine was there in England, he wrote letters to St. Gregory asking him how he should handle certain problems, certain missionary problems. For example, he would write to him and, and said, you know, what am I supposed to do with their temples? They have all these pagan temples that, that they used to go to and worship. Should I just destroy them and get rid of those pagan temples? Or what should I do? And Gregory wrote back to him and said, no, don't destroy the temples. Rather, reconsecrate those temples as churches and consecrate them to Christ. You know, take away anything that may be, you know, symbolic in the temple that is pagan, but consecrate those temples to Christ because the people are used to, by habit, going to that specific structure for worship. So allow that habit to continue so that they know that's the place where they're supposed to go to worship. But instead of worshiping a false god or false gods when they go to this location, now, since you have brought Christ to them, they are going to that location to worship the one true God. So don't destroy it. Christianize it. And then he asked the same, he asked a similar question, St. Augustine did to St. Gregory, and said, what am I supposed to do with their festivals? You know, they like to get together and, and have these festivals, to, you know, pagan festivals of different god and goddesses. Am I supposed to abolish those, or what do I do with those? And St. Gregory said, no, again, Christianize them. Instead of, instead of centering the, the festival on some pagan god or goddess, instead center the festival on a saint, or center the festival on a, on a feast of Our Lady, or something like that. So again, Christianize what they are doing rather than just eradicate it as a whole. Now, why that's important and why they bring that up is because that's really the missionary procedures that the church used throughout the rest of history. I mean, this is, this is the way the church even missions you know, today. Is that the church doesn't operate from a perspective of we need to go in and destroy indigenous cultures. 
Instead, if you look at the church's history honestly, and the missionary history of the church honestly, you see that missionaries went with an understanding of learning first the cultures of the people that they went to mission to. And then they took what was good from those cultures, and they Christianized those cultures. And they tried to bring people into, a light, you know, into Christ and into the church in a way that made sense for the people living in that culture. Because often we hear today you know, from different secular historians and whatnot that the church is the greatest you know, destroyer of indigenous cultures in the history of the world. And that's just, that's false. It's patently historically false. Now, were there European colonists who did go into places like South America and, and Mexico and other places and really did, you know, try to force European culture and civilization on, na on the native indigenous people? Yes, they were. They did. But these were not necessarily representatives of the church, and they weren't missionaries. They were colonists. They were people from those governments, not representatives of the church. So it's very important we understand that historical distinction. The church has always upheld the, the worth of indigenous cultures and the, and the worth of, of people who live in their native lands. Again, the point being to bring Christ and the gospel of Christ to them so that they, they come into the light of faith. But it starts here with Gregory and it continues on through the history of the church. Now also during this time, even a little before this time really, we have the conversion of the island of Ireland. So we have the great missionary St. Saint, Saint Patrick who, as we all know, goes through the island of Ireland and, and, and converts the people. And monasteries and convents then erupt throughout the entire island. The Irish really embrace the Catholic faith. They make a great contribution to the faith. They themselves become wonderful missionaries, going to the continent and missioning to, to uh, you know, pagan Germanic tribes or tribes which had embraced Arianism. They even go to places like Iceland and possibly to North America like St. Brendan. And so we have uh, one historian has actually referred to Ireland as the, at this time as the nursery of the saints. It's an island that just grew holy people during this time. And these people went and they missioned and brought the light of Christ to others. Now there are many, many stories I can tell you of great Irish saints, great and wonderful Irish missionaries that contributed amazingly to the church and to the history of the Western civilization. But as you know from my last name, my last name is Weidenkopf. I'm not Irish. Therefore, I'm not going to talk about the Irish anymore. I'm going to talk about the true and authentic missionaries, the Germans. So we're going to talk about one German in one missionary to the Germans in particular, St. Boniface. Now, to give you full disclosure, St. Boniface was not German. He was English. Um, but he went to Germany in mission to the Germans. So we'll, we'll count him as a German for, for the purposes of tonight. So St. Boniface goes to admissions to the, the people of Germany, what is modern-day Germany. And one historian has said about St. Boniface that he was probably the greatest missionary since St. Paul. The greatest missionary. Now, how many people know about St. Boniface? And it's, right, heart, a few. I mean, unfortunately, his story is not well told and not well known. And it's kind of a travesty, really, because, you know, he really was one of the greatest missionaries, if not the greatest missionary since St. Paul. Now, one great story of St. Boniface that kind of captures the essence of his missionary activities is he and some companions w went to a village, the village of Geismar, uh, around Christmas time in, in the 8th century. And while he, in this village of Geismar, there was this large oak tree that the pagans used to go to once a year, the pagan Germans used to go to in this village once a year, and they used to sacrifice a young child at this tree every year to the god Thor. And so they worshipped, you know, around this tree, and they worshipped the, the god of Thor around this huge oak tree. They called it the Thunder Oak Tree of Thor. And so St. Boniface knew that this tree existed, and they knew, he knew that this human sacrifice was going on, and he wanted to put an end to it. So he went to this village to, to stop this pagan sacrifice, this human sacrifice. Now, the, the pagan Germans had boasted that there was no way that the Christian god of St. Boniface could ever destroy the thunder oak tree of Thor. It was just too massive and too large, and Thor is much more powerful than the Christian god, who's weak. There's no way that Boniface could do anything about this. So Boniface decided to take up this challenge, and with his companions, he went to this village on Christmas Eve in the 8th century, and he walked through the middle of the pagans, and he picked up an axe... And he looked at the oak tree, and with his axe, he struck the thunder oak tree once with his axe, and the, the tree then fell completely, miraculously. And behind this big, huge oak tree was a small little fir tree. And he looks at the fir tree, and he looks at the, the pagans, the German pagans assembled around the tree, and he says this to them. He says, this little tree, a young child of the forest, shall be your holy tree tonight. It is the wood of peace. It is the sign of an endless life, for its leaves are evergreen. See how it points upward to heaven. Let this be called the tree of the Christ child. Gather about it, not in the wild wood, but in your own homes. There it will shelter no deeds of blood, but loving gifts and rites of kindness. So this is the tradition of the Christmas tree. You ever wonder where we got that tradition? 
why that's associated with, because if you go to Bethlehem, there's a lot of pine trees, right? A lot of fir trees in Bethlehem. No. How did that ever come into, you know, into our, our tradition that we would associate a tree with the birth of Christ, right? Especially this pine tree. Well, it comes from St. Boniface, and it became a German tradition from the time of St. Boniface, and obviously when the Germans immigrated here, like my family did, in the 19th century en masse to the United States, they brought that tradition with them. It became, you know, widely accepted, and now it's widely accepted throughout the world. And you even have people today who are not Catholic, not Christian, who use the Christmas tree, right? So this coming Christmas, you're talking to your coworkers or whatever, and you know that they're not practicing their faith, or they may not be Christian, and they go out and they say they're going to buy a Christmas tree. You can tell them the story of St. Boniface and where we get this tradition. So it's an opportunity to spread the gospel in kind of a non-threatening, kind of cool way, just by telling this story. Now, ultimately, this tribe was baptized, and St. Boniface went and spread the gospel throughout other regions of Germany, uh, throughout the regions of Germany, and even into uh, what is mo- we would call modern-day uh, the Netherlands and Holland, where he met martyrdom in the year 754. A great, great man. Now, it's very, very important for us to know our Catholic story and to have an identity as Catholics through understanding our history. I mentioned that in the first time that we were together, my, our first talk s- several weeks ago. Why that's important is because Knowing our history and knowing it from a Catholic perspective is very important because we need to be able to pass that on to our children. And I just tell you this interesting story of um, this past Christmas, my young daughter, Therese, who's here. Say hi, Therese. Hi. Therese was reading the Washington Post mini page, right? The little Washington Post mini page is a little newspaper for kids, you know, put out by the Washington Post. And she's reading about this, and it's this whole little story about the Christmas tree. And here's what she read, and she, bring, she brought it to me when she read it. She was horrified. But this is what it said. One legend says, this asking the question, where do we get the tradition of the Christmas tree? The post author says this. One legend says that during the early 1500s, a priest named Martin Luther was walking through, was walking through the winter woods when he saw snow-covered evergreen trees. He thought they were so beautiful that he brought a small fir tree inside and decorated it with candles to honor Jesus' birth. So the Washington Post is telling our young children and our young people that the whole tradition of the Christmas tree comes from Martin Luther. Is that right, Therese? No. no. See? It's why it's important for us to tell. She was horrified. She came running to me, Dad, Dad, look what they're saying in the paper. This is totally wrong. They didn't even mention St. Boniface. It's important for us to be able to know our story and know it as Catholics and have that identity as Catholics so we can teach it to our young people because if we don't, right, our history will be presented in another way, a way that is not necessarily factually or historically correct. Now, did Martin Luther probably, did he have a Christmas tree? Sure. Where did he get that tradition? From St. Boniface. Okay. <laughs> he didn't create that tradition himself. All right, so, but he's German, so obviously he would know the tradition. But very, very important for us to know our own history as Catholics. Now, I mentioned earlier when we, talking, when we talked about the, uh, at the beginning of our talk tonight about how there were many things that affected the church during this time, this dark time really in church history. And I mentioned the rise of the movement of Islam, which is something that still affects us today. So during this period of time in the 7th century, we see the rise of this movement uh, known as Islam. And it starts here with the prophet, the, the so-called prophet Muhammad, who was born in Mecca in the year 570. When he was around 40 years old, he had a unique, what he believed was some kind of unique supernatural experience. He was up in a cave, as it was his custom, outside of the city of Mecca, and was there. While he was in this cave, he had a visit from some sort of supernatural visitor. Now, later, Muslim writers would, would, would attribute that this, the supernatural visitor that came to Muhammad was the Archangel Gabriel. But that necessarily wasn't what Muhammad believed at the time, because Muhammad was scared out of his wits when he, when he had this first visitation. So scared that he actually became incredibly depressed. He had no idea what it was that had just happened to him. Became very depressed and was actually on the point of suicide. But he takes this visit, he takes this whole experience of this visitation back to his wife, who is much older than he was, and he, she, he told her what had happened to him in the cave. Now, she decides to take him to an uncle of hers who was a kind of a, a religious man, a spiritual man, who knew of the Christian faith, but he knew it in a heretical form. He knew it in the form of Nestorianism. Remember last week we talked about Nestorius, who had been patriarch of Constantinople, who believed that, that Mary was not the mother of God, but rather just the mother of Christ, and really believed that there were two persons in Christ, a, a divine person and a human person. So there was this perverted form of the Christian faith, which was prevalent and was known in the Arabian Peninsula. But he goes, she takes him, Mohammed to her uncle, and he tells him the story of what had happened to him, and the, the uncle believed that this was an authentic uh, experience, religious experience, and his advice to Mohammed was to, was to go back to the cave and to see if the being appeared again. 
So Muhammad did that. So over the next three years, he, be, he has these series of private revelations, which he kept very, very private. He only told a few people in his inner circle what these revelations were for three years. At the end of that three-year period of time, he then made these revelations public. And what he began to teach was very, very revolutionary for the people in the Arabian Peninsula. Because during the time of Muhammad's life, the people in the Arabian Peninsula were very nomadic, tribal-type people who believed in a pantheon of gods. They were very polytheistic. And many of us have seen you know, pi the picture of the big black box, for lack of a better term, the Kaaba, which is in Mecca, you know, where, where Muslims go on pilgrimage and they walk around uh, the, the Kaaba. Well, the Kaaba actually was a, sh is a, was a big kind of uh, shrine. And inside the shrine, there were individual shrines for all of the gods that the people of the Arabian Pen Peninsula believed in. There were 360 gods that they believed in. And 359 of those gods had a specific shrine inside the Kaaba. And people would go to the Kaaba and worship those individual gods. There was one god who was known to the Arabian uh, people in the Arabian Peninsula, but who did not have a shrine in the Kaaba, and that god was known as Allah. And so what Muhammad does is Muhammad, in a revolutionary way, it says that all of the gods, all the 359 gods that, that people profess a belief in, they are false gods. They are wrong. There's only one true god, and the one true god that exists is Allah, the one that does not have an idol or a shrine in the, in the Kaaba. So he says, Allah is the God that we need to worship and him alone, and I am his prophet. We must submit our wills and submit ourselves to this one God, Allah, which is where we get the word and get the name for this movement, Islam. Islam means submission of your will to the will of Allah. Islam does not, contrary to popular belief and, and modern media, mean peace. It does not mean that. It means submission of your will to the will of of Allah. Ultimately, Muhammad then has to flee Mecca. He preaches his teachings. His teachings do not gain acceptance among the people in Mecca. He then has to flee to a city which is later known as Medina. And then while in Medina, he begins to collect more and more followers and then launches out in various military campaigns and military raids on different caravans and tries to consolidate his power through the Arabian Peninsula. Ultimately, he does go and conquer the city of Mecca in the year 630. Now, he taught, again, that there is no God but Allah. And, that, and this was kind of revolutionary because he was trying to get rid of all the polytheistic, uh, this polytheism in the Arabian Peninsula. He believed that we should submit our wills totally to the will of Allah. And then he also formed what came to be known as the Ummah, or the community of believers. So Muhammad really wanted to focus on kind of uniting the people in the Arabian Peninsula into this community. And he, divided, he devised this kind of dichotomy of society, where there were people who believed in Muhammad and believed that he was the prophet of Allah, and those were members of the community, the Ummah, the House of Islam. There were those who were outside the community who didn't believe that, and those outside the community were, no, were given the name the House of War. So those outside of the community of Muslim believers are in the house of war. And it was the job and the duty of Muhammad and all Muslim believers to bring those in the house of war into the house of Islam, into the house of, of the community of believers to the Ummah. And how one goes about doing that is through jihad, through an armed violent struggle to bring those outside the community into the community if they don't come in of their own volition. Now, Muhammad had a very interesting personal life. Throughout the course of his life, he ended up, um, at, as a total, had 14 wives. His favorite wife was actually a nine-year-old. Um, he married her when she was six, but he, he waited till she was nine to actually consummate the marriage. He was in his 50s uh, when that happened. And this whole practice of, of child marriage and of, of, young, of marrying young girls is still practiced in some Muslim countries today. Not every Muslim country, but some Muslim countries still practice this today. Some of us probably recall back in 1979, 1980, there was this Islamic revolution in the country of Iran. Uh, and there, we had an embassy in Iran that was overrun, and we had hostages being held in that embassy for 444 days. Many of us remember that whole event. Well, the religious leader of those who rose up, those kind of students really that rose up in that revolution, was a man by the name of Ayatollah Khomeini. Remember, remember his name? Well, Ayatollah Khomeini, actually, when he was 28, married a 10-year-old girl. Just to give you one kind of data point of this practice was still being practiced in you know, the 80s. It's still being practiced in parts of, of the Islamic world today. Muhammad, as one of his 14 wives, he actually even took his daughter-in-law as his wife. He had an adopted son. This woman was married to his adopted son. He had a supposed revelation from Allah, which said that he was to take his adopted son's wife, his daughter-in-law, as his own wife, which he then did. 
So this is the kind of man that we're dealing with. He was also extremely ruthless. He ordered the assassination of those who were politically and personally opposed to him, including three poets uh, at one point, one of which was a woman who had five children, and she was murdered in her bed uh, while she was sleeping. So this is, again, the type of man that we're dealing with. In the year 632, he died in his farewell address. He said to his followers before his death, he said, Fight all men until they say there is no God but Allah. It was his, one of his marching orders to his, his followers before his death. Fight all men until they say there is no God but Allah. Now contrast that with the words of Jesus Christ, his last words. Right? As he ascends into heaven, what did he say to his, his apostles? I go therefore. Make disciples, teach, baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We see two totally different ways of evangelization and two totally different ways of missionary efforts being presented by two completely different men. Now, obviously, Muhammad's followers took his teachings to heart, and upon his death, they began to actively embark in this imperialistic campaign to conquer territory and to bring those in the house of war into the house of believers, into the Ummah. And so all the, most of the ancient Christian lands begin to then fall throughout the 7th century. The, the uh, nation of, or the area of Syria falls in 635. The city, the ancient city of Antioch, which we've talked about um, extensively through our time here the last couple of weeks, especially when we looked at St. Ignatius of Antioch, that great bishop who was martyred in the 2nd century. Antioch was, was uh, conquered by a Muslim army in 637. The ancient Christian land of Egypt was conquered in 642. The holy city of Jerusalem itself fell in 638. A Muslim army, when they conquered the holy city of Jerusalem in 638, destroyed over 300 Christian churches throughout the city. In the, by the year 700, they had gone through all of the last Christian stronghold in North Africa had fallen, and they had conquered all of North Africa, as you can see on your map. They then cross the Straits of Gibraltar and go into the Iberian Peninsula and then begin a campaign in the year 704 to conquer the nation, what we know as Spain. Ultimately, they do conquer Spain by the year 711. There's a small little Catholic outpost that remains in the mountains of Spain, which will, from that base of operations, will then launch out and begin the reconquest of, of the Iberian Peninsula from the Muslims, which will take them 770 years to accomplish. It's not until the year 1492 that the last Muslim st stronghold in Granada in Spain is ultimately finally conquered and the Muslims are finally expelled from the ancient Christian land of Spain. Ultimately, they leave uh, Spain and they cross the Pyrenees Mountains and they go into what we know as the modern-day nation of France in the year 732. So 100 years after Muhammad's death, an armed Muslim invasion force is now into France. They have uh, an invasion force of about 20,000 men. Their objective was to raid deep into Frankish territory to soften up the defenses for a full-scale invasion. That was their strategic objective. Their immediate tactical objective was to go to the city of Tours, where there was a shrine to St. Martin, and to destroy that shrine and, and despoil it. Along their path, they plundered every church and monastery that they came into contact with on their way up to uh, Tours. They never actually got to Tours. Instead, they were met by a Frankish army at the, at the city of Poitiers, at the little town of Poitiers. And so in 732, a great battle was fought between the Muslim, this Muslim invasion force and the Franks under the leadership of a man by the name of Charles. Charles would later be given the title Martel, which in French means hammer, because he and his Frankish army defeat this Muslim army in the year 732 at the Battle of Poitiers. So he's Charles Martel, or the hammer of the Muslims. Now interestingly, Poitiers is only 120 miles southwest of Paris. So basically a two-hour drive from Paris is where this Muslim invasion force was. Now, if you can imagine, if Charles Martel had not defeated this invasion force, how history would be completely changed. Western civilization would be changed. The history of our church would be completely changed had Charles Martel and his Franks not defeated this Muslim force in 732. And he resoundedly defeated them. It's estimated that about 40 to 50 percent of the Muslim force was killed as a result of this battle. So they, they had 40 to 50 percent casualties, which is a high, high rate of casualties. The Muslim actually name for this battle is, translates as the Road of the Martyrs. So many of their troops were killed during this battle. That's how they refer to the battle itself. Now, the Muslims would continue to raid all through Europe during the course of the 8th and 9th centuries. They even, in the 9th century, in 846, went and um, raided the city of Rome. Little known historical event, they raided the city of Rome. They went and they plundered the city, including the churches of St. Peter and St. Paul. 
pope at the time was Pope Leo IV. He actually organized defense of the city and began the building of defensive works around the city walls, basically to try to protect the city against this, these raiding Muslims. And if you go to Rome today, you can still see remnants of they're called the Leonine Walls. And that stems from the 9th century. And those walls were there because the pope was building these defensive works to try to keep the Muslim inv invasion force out of the city. Now, if you were a Christian in one of these lands that had been conquered by the Muslims, your life was really not that great. Life in a conquered Muslim territory was, for a Christian or a Jew, was not all that cracked up to be at all. If you were a Muslim or, or if you're a Christian or a Jew living in a Muslim conquered territory, you had to pay a tax every year to the local Muslim ruler and in return for peace and reconciliation. Basically, you kind of bribed them to not harass you. It didn't always work necessarily, but you still had to pay the tax. It was required every year. It was required everyone had to pay the tax, children, widows, orphans, and even people who were dead. So if you had members of your family who were dead, you still had to pay the tax. It still counted against your household. You had to pay the tax. If you're a Christian or Jew living in these lands, you were outlawed uh, from, from owning or possessing any form of weaponry. They also outlawed the ringing of church bells, they did allow churches, in, in some places, they allowed churches to continue to exist, but there were severe restrictions on the repairing of existing Christian churches. There were also severe restrictions on building new churches. So you were allowed to keep the existing structure in some cases, um, but you couldn't necessarily restore it, or if you did, it was under really extreme circumstances, and you couldn't build anything new. Christians or Jews in, in Muslim-occupied territories couldn't testify in court. They had, in a court of law, they had to wear special clothing, and a special identifying marker to distinguish them from everyone else in society. There was an extreme and heavy pressure on you as a Christian or a Jew living in these territories to convert to Islam. Now, one thing to keep, the one point I want to make that, to make sure we historically, we're historically accurate with this is that it's not necessarily historically true that every time you know, a Muslim army came into an area and they conquered the area, they forced everybody at the sword to become Muslim. That's not true. Now, there are cases when that did happen, there are also cases when they wrote where they left Christians and Jews for the most part alone. You had to pay this tax, but you weren't necessarily forced to convert. But society was structured in those territories such that if you weren't Muslim, you basically, your life was a little bit better than a slave. I mean, you could not advance in any way, shape, or form in society. You could not hold any kind of important or governmental job, obviously, unless you were a member of the community of believers, a member of the Ummah. So there was heavy societal pressure on Christians and Jews in these conquered territories to convert, and many, many did. Some did maintain their faith, and there are remnants of Christians still in these areas, but unfortunately many, many did convert. Now there was, just to give you an example of what, what life was like in one area, in Egypt in the 7th century, soon after its, um, when it was conquered, there was the caliph there ordered every publicly visible cross destroyed, and had ordered also that every Christian church had to bear this inscription on its door. And the inscription was this, Mohammed is the great apostle of God, and Jesus also is the apostle of God. But truly God is not begotten and does not beget. So this is a direct attack on the central you know, uh, teaching of our faith. That Jesus is true God and true man. So if you're a Christian living in Egypt in the 7th century, when you walked into your church every day or every Sunday, you saw that inscription reminding you over and over again that you know, Mohammed is a true prophet, Jesus is a true prophet, but God does not have a son. And so you're reminded of that all the time. So again, there's this heavy societal pressure to convert. Now, one person who did have to deal a little bit, or actually went on military campaign against the Muslims uh, at one point during his reign is the Emperor Charlemagne, who I've, I've mentioned. And this is, in, in our time period of missionaries and the emperor, this is the emperor. Now, Charlemagne has a very interesting history and backstory. He's the grandson of Charles Martel, who we just talked about. Charles Martel, who led that army, who defeated the, the uh, Muslims in at Poitiers in 732. So he's the grandson of Charles Martel. He's the son of a man who's known in history as Pepin the Short. Now, Pepin is called the Short because he actually was short. He, had a very, he was short in stature. Sometimes these historical nicknames make sense. <laughs> it's not because he had a short reign, but because he actually was a short man. But uh, Charlemagne was not, so he must have got that from his mother's side. But Pepin was very, very short. Now, Pepin was interesting. Pepin, along with Charles Martel, were held the title in the Frankish kingdom. They were known as the Mayors of the Palace. And the Mayors of the Palace is kind of a fancy title for us. It, a good compliment or, or a, uh, a good way to understand that title, Mayors of the Palace, is that they were the commander-in-chief of the army, 
And they also were what we would call like the prime minister of government, a good way to kind of think of them. So they really kind of held the reins of, of government. They actually were the ones who implemented and executed you know, the government in the Frankish kingdom. But they weren't the king. There was a king, um, but it was not Pepin. Now, Pepin does something very interesting. He decides to write a letter to the pope in Rome. And he asks the, the pope in Rome a question. He says, now, who should really be king in a land? Should it be the one who just holds the title and you know, is nominally considered the king? Or should it be the one who actually wields the power? the one who wields the authority. Who should really be king? Well, you know, kind of a logical question. The pope responds in a logical manner and says, well, obviously the one who should be king is the one who, has, who exercises the actual power, not some kind of figurehead. So Pepin decided to take that as an excuse, or as his justification, rather, to overthrow the Frankish kings, who at this time were known as the Merovingians. Many of you might have heard the Merovingians because they're also very popular nowadays with um, our good friend who we talked about last week, Dan Brown, and as Da Vinci Code mentioned the Merovingian line of kings. And so they're kind of popular now in, in Hollywood and different novels. But the Merovingian kings, at least at this time, when Pepin was, was uh, coming to the, to the picture, were very ineffectual, very, very weak kings. And so the Holy Father writes this letter back to Pepin. Pepin decides to use this as justification to th overthrow the Merovingian kings, and he establishes himself as now king of the Franks. So he becomes king of the Franks. And he also does another very important thing. He goes down into northern, northern Italy, and he defeats a Germanic tribe known as the Lombards. The Lombards were raising havoc all throughout northern Italy and were affecting the Pope even. And so the, the Franks come down en masse. They defeat the Lombards. And basically the territory that they conquered really in essence was Byzantine territory that the Lombards had taken from the Byzantines. But Pepin decides not to give it back to the Byzantine Empire. He decides instead to donate it to the Pope in Rome. So this is the creation of what is known, and it comes to be known in history as the Papal States. The Pope actually becoming a temporal ruler of certain you know, land and certain areas in the Italian peninsula. And this will cause all kinds of interesting events and, and problems in the rest of the history of the papacy as you, as you move forward from this time on to the rest of church history. But it starts here. Now in return for this donation of land and the creation of these Papal States, Pope Stephen III gives Pepin and his sons the title uh, Patrician of the Romans patrician of the Romans, which in effect meant that the king of the Franks was the defender of the papacy, the personal protector of the pope. That comes very important when Charlemagne later will come down to the city and to do just that, will protect a pope. Now Charlemagne was a very interesting character. One historian has described him as this, that he was a striking man, handsome, over six feet tall, so remember he got that from his mom's side, not from Pepin. He had a kingly stride, he, was pierc he had piercing eyes, long nose, thick neck, good sense of humor, deeply Catholic. He went to Mass every morning and Vespers every night. He was a man who was in, really uh, devoted to the faith, devoted to the church, and a man of great personal faith. He did launch a military campaign into Spain against a, a particular Muslim ruler in the year 778. Uh, he was really defeated in that campaign and had to kind of hightail it back and retreat across the Pyrenees. Many of you might have read during the course of your studies the, the kind of poem known as the Song of Roland. Anybody who's read that? Anybody hear that? Uh, that kind of that song, uh, that epic poem stems from this period of time, uh, or at least it tells the story of this period of time when Charlemagne and his army is leaving uh, in retreat from, from Spain uh, as a result of that campaign. He also waged a military campaign against a Germanic tribe uh, in modern-day Germany that's known as the Saxons. He launched this campaign against the Saxons because the Saxons were fierce pagans. They were one of the few, and almost probably the last remaining Germanic tribe that had not had converted, that had not converted to the faith. They were very wild, fierce. They practiced human sacrifice as well as cannibalism. And so he launched frequent raids against the Saxons to try to bring them into the faith. Ultimately, he spent over 30 years trying to bring them into the Catholic faith. And it was a fierce struggle. He would launch a raid. He and his army would go into the land of Saxony. He would defeat the pagans. They would be, you know, uh, they would agree to come into the church, and then he would leave. But then they would, as soon as Charlemagne and his army left, they would revert back to their pagan ways. He'd have to go back with another army, and this went back and forth and back and forth for 30 years. Very difficult to really convert, to have a lasting conversion uh, for the Saxons. So one of the things that as a result of that is he passed a series of laws that had to be followed in Saxony that were very, very strict. And some of these laws were this, that anyone, this is just for Saxony, anyone who in contempt of the Christian faith refuses to respect the holy fast of Lent and eats meat shall be put to death. So if you were a Saxon uh, during the time of Charlemagne and you didn't fast and didn't, you know, you didn't abstain from meat during Lent, you could be put to death. Again, kind of harsh, but the reason for the harshness, the context for the harshness is because he had to keep going back and back and back to try to maintain these people in the faith. 
Another law was anyone who commits a dead body to the flames following pagan rites shall be put to death. So again, harsh, but under the context, you know, understandable from what he was trying to do. Now, it's important to know that Charlemagne's policy, his standard imperial policy, was to not convert people by the sword. That was not his standard policy. He had to do so in this one particular ex um, example, this one particular situation with the Saxons, because of who they were and how they kept going back into paganism. So it was very, very unique, just to keep that uh, in mind. Ultimately, what happens to how he becomes the Holy Roman Emperor is Pope Leo III in 799 is attacked by a mob in Rome as he's processing through the streets. This is a very dangerous time for the popes. Um, We'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute towards the end. But there were different factions and different groups in Rome that, again, were trying to control the papacy, as I mentioned. And so Leo was attacked by one particular mob. Uh, he was personally harassed. You know, he was kind of miraculously saved from any kind of, of severe and long-lasting physical problems from that attack. So then, ultimately, as a result of that, Charlemagne hears of this and decides to come down to Rome with an army to protect the pope. And on Christmas Day of the year 800, he is crowned emperor by the Holy Father. And ultimately, this comes to be known, this, this empire that's established comes to be known as the Holy Roman Empire. And we can see the Charlemagne's empire, the land of his empire, was actually very extensive. I mean, it covered all of what we know as modern-day France, even into parts of modern-day Germany, down even into parts of modern-day Italy, and even, you could, we could say, a little bit into, into Spain, although not much. He was a great Christian ruler. He really was. He ruled and reigned for 42 years as king of the Franks. He created a... a organized and structured governmental system, a central governmental system, which Europe had not seen for quite some time. Um, one historian has said that Constantine gave men the vision of what a Christian emperor could do. Charlemagne showed what a Christian emperor did do. He was very devoted to the faith, very devoted to protecting the Holy Father and the church as a whole. Ultimately, the Holy Roman Empire would last for a thousand years, where finally in the year 1806 it was abolished by the French emperor Napoleon. And it's, its history is one of, of you know, varying history and its relationship with the church as a whole. Now, I mentioned earlier that one of the other important things that Charlemagne did during the course of his reign is he brought forth this flourishing of learning, a flourishing of art and architecture and learning throughout his, his, his empire. And this is known in history as the Carolingian Renaissance. He really kind of had a united culture throughout his territory. Again, something that the Western civilization hadn't seen since the time of the Roman Empire. And this was really brought about through the actions of a particular British monk whom he brought from England to his court, a man by the name of Alcuin of York. And Alcuin was set upon the task by Charlemagne to create a, an educational system that would be empire-wide. And it would be a standardized educational system. And what Alcuin of York created is what we know today as the liberal arts curriculum. He created when, what we know in history as is, is the trivium, or the study of the subjects of grammar, logic, and rhetoric. And he also created the quadrivium, or the study of four subjects, arithmetic, geometry, astronomy, and music. So it's here in the 9th century, the 8th century rather, where we have the establishment of the, liberal, the basic liberal arts curriculum that forms the foundation of learning in our universities, even to our own day and age. So very, very important. Also, as I mentioned earlier, Charlemagne really sponsored and fostered the growth of Benedictine monasteries and really wanted the monks in these monasteries to, to work in these scriptoriums to continue to make copies of ancient manuscripts and classical literature. Ultimately, Charlemagne divides his empire, which was Frankish custom, among his sons. He had three. So upon his death, the empire was then disunited and broken into three different factions. Ultimately, it would no longer exist as a united empire. Under a brief reign, a brief time in the 10th century, it was Germany was kind of reunited, or that area of Germany was reunited under the Emperor Otto the Great. But for the most part, after the death of Charlemagne, this united kind of um, you know, one central governmental authority in Europe collapses. Now to figure out, to, we, we cha change tax here and move a little bit to the east and look at just one heresy here toward, at the end of our time to look at what was going on in the east. And one thing that was going on in the east during the time of Charlemagne was the arrival of this heresy known as iconoclasm. And this her heresy basically is, is, we get the word iconoclasm from the, the Greek which means image breaking. It was a period of time in the church, especially in the East, where it was seen as idolatrous to have any form of representation of God or of Mary of the saints. And how this came about was the emperor uh, in the east, Emperor Leo III in 726, believed that, that God was angry because of widespread idolatry throughout the empire. And so he began to order the destruction of public Christian images. This was very unpopular among the people in the east. There were riots that broke out. 
in Constantinople and other major cities of the East because of this. The Pope heard of what the emperor was doing in the East and, and was abolishing and trying to get rid of these images. And so he wrote a letter in, to the emperor condemning this heresy. And this is what Pope Gregory wrote to the emperor. He said, Christ knows that so often as we go into the church of St. Peter and see the picture of this saint, we are moved and tears flow from us. Christ has made the blind to see. You have made the seeing blind. You say we worship stones and walls and boards, but it is not so, O Emperor, but they serve us for remembrance and encouragement, lifting our slow spirits upwards to those whose names the pictures bear. And we worship them not as God, as you maintain, God forbid. So again, we have the Pope you know, interjecting himself here in this whole issue that's, that's really kind of tearing apart the East. And he, he says, here's the story. I mean, this, we're not worshiping these images. You know, rather, these images call to mind those whom we actually reverence. And so Leo ultimately dies, and he's replaced by Constantine V. Now, Constantine V begins to ratchet up the persecution. Not only does he order the destruction of images and the destruction of, of, these, of different icons and whatnot, he actually then begins to arrest monks and nuns, have them tortured, thrown into prison, and even executed. He ultimately will die. He's replaced by another emperor who sh dies shortly thereafter him, and ultimately who comes to the throne is an empress, a woman by the name of Irene. And what Irene does is she calls a council in the year 787 that meets in the city of, of Nicaea, where the first ecumenical council of the church met. And it's at this council where the pope was invited, and he approves of the calling of this council, where this whole discussion of iconoclasm and, and, and idolatry is discussed. And really it's this council that defines our teachings on worship and veneration. And this teaching, this council comes up with three specific words to help us understand what it, how we worship and how, what the relationship is with God, our relationship with Mary and the saints. And so these words that the council came up with is, there's a specific understanding of, the, of God, and we worship God and we worship only God. And the word we use for that, or the, the Greeks would use for that, is latria. That is worship of God. Then there is also this special reverence that we have, in particular for the Blessed Virgin Mary and her role in the economy of salvation, and that word is hyperdulia. And then there's another reverence that we have for the saints themselves, and that is referred to what we use as dulia. So we do not worship Mary, right? As we all know, we're good Catholics. We don't worship Mary, despite what some people might say. We don't worship Mary. We don't worship the saints. We have special reverence for them, right? But we don't worship them. We worship only God alone. We latree them only. Only God is the only one whom we worship. The council also said that icons can be used because they're just an image. It's an image that is used to help inspire love and devotion. And the council in its decree said this, For the honor which is shown to the figure passes over to the original, and whoever does reverence to an image does reverence to the person represented by it. So again, we're not worshiping the image, we're not worshiping the icon, we're not worshiping the tilma of Our Lady. Rather, we are showing special reverence to whom the image represents, to Our Lady herself or to the, you know, God or to Christ through the icon. The council also acknowledged in particular the, the effect in, of the writings of St. John Damascene. St. John Damascene is one of the fathers of the church, one of the doctors of the church, rather, known as the doctor of Christian art. And he wrote a series of, of works, a series of, of uh, apologies, really, to the apologias, to the emperor, defending the use of sacred imagery. And this is what he said to the, uh, to the emperor. He said, since the invisible God took on flesh, we may make images of Christ, who was visible, and picture him in all his activities. So, I mean, what a, what a fantastic display of, of teaching, of theological and even catechetical teaching. All things come back to Christ. And this is how he explained it to the emperor. Look, we're not worshiping these things, but, but, and it's, it's acceptable for us to make icons and to make statues because he who was invisible became visible for us. Right? And so in a certain sense, by breaking these images and by, by doing away with these, you're really engaging in an attack upon Christ himself. Fabulous, fabulous, and very, very brilliant man in the history of the church. Now, as I mentioned, the 9th and 10th centuries are marked by this kind of this dark time in the history of the church, and they're really marked by violent physical struggles. It's during this time of the 9th and 10th centuries where we see the rise of the Vikings throughout Europe. This is when the Vikings will come and they'll attack monasteries, especially in England and Ireland, even on the continent. In the year 845, they come to, on Easter Sunday, actually, they sail up the Seine River to, in Paris and with 120 ships, and they sack the entire city of Paris. They also and they ended up ravaging Europe over, for over 200 years. It's also during this time, as we come to the end of our time period here of missionaries and the emperor, where we see society 
creating this structure known that we come to know as feudalism. This whole understanding where society is based on a personal relationship between a lord and those who, who are, work his land, between a lord and his, his um, you know, serfs and also other knights who are, owe fealty to a particular lord. So society begins to be structured, instead of you know, any kind of government, you know, uh, unique governmental structure or the structure that used to exist in the Roman Empire, now it's based on you know, personal relationships. And it's based on a relationship that you have with the land and the, that you have then to your lord. Also, it's during this time we see the, this code of conduct that flourishes in Europe at this time known as chivalry. This word begins to develop and then it will flourish later on. During this time in Europe, there's a period of stagnation, really, of learning. This is after the time of Charlemagne. There really, people in Europe, there was learning that was going on, but really in education. But the learning and education was really concentrated on preserving what, what had been you know, collected, not on advancing learning. So it's really not during this period of time in the West that we have any kind of major theological thinkers. You know, or any kind of huge development of doctrine during this time. Because people at this time were, because of the chaos and the lack of a political organized structure, were just pretty, pretty much just kind of maintaining the status quo. Art and architecture are fixed at this period of time. Anybody, if you know about art and architecture, it's a period of time of the Romanesque architecture. There's not a huge advancement in architecture. It's really just kind of taking what the Roman architecture was and making small uh, changes to it. You know, it wouldn't be until later on in the Middle Ages, the medieval period, where you get that really radical change in architecture in the Gothic period of architecture. Finally, we come to the end of our time with, a, with a, a bright light that appears at the end of this dark time, which will then really shape the future of the church as she moves into the next century, in particular in the 11th century. And this here, at the, end, at the beginning of the 10th century, is the establishment of the monastery of Cluny. And why this is important is because Cluny will then go on to become very, very uh, important that this monastery will, and monks from this monastery will go throughout Europe and they'll establish other monasteries that were, are related and are structured with Cluny. And this Cluniac reform will begin to overtake the church and ultimately there will be several monks from this abbey of Cluny who will become popes. And they become popes in the 11th century, uh, three of them, and one of them becomes pope in the 14th century. But these three, in particular, monks from Cluny in the 11th century uh, will begin this reform of the papacy, where they will make the papacy independent from these secular rulers that are trying to control it, and they will then usher in this, this growth of, of the church and of the faith as a whole throughout Europe, and will begin to see the rise of Christendom and the glory of Christendom in these later medieval periods, including the advent and the beginning of the crusading movement, which really... A proper way in which to understand the Crusades, and I know you've had some talks by the, from um, Professor McGuire on the Crusades, an excellent uh, historian in that area, that really the Crusading movement is to really be seen as an outgrowth of this reform movement within the church, and especially a reform movement from the monks here at Cluny who later become popes. One thing that was really unique about Cluny, just to end, is that Cluny, unlike other monasteries, was established with a structure that the abbot of that monastery reported directly to the pope, not to the local bishop. And that made a huge difference because Cluny then was a very independent monastery. And the abbot of Cluny could then progress or move along this path of reform and not have to worry about any kind of local interference from the bishop. So it was a very unique structure. And the whole reason why this, this monastery was even established was there was a, a duke by the name of William of Aquitaine who established this monastery because earlier in his life he had killed a man in a fit of rage that plagued him throughout his life. And he, he basically established this monastery so that the monks would, he would have some group of religious to pray for him and pray for his soul the rest of eternity. And that was the whole reason why Cluny was established. But ultimately it grows into this wonderful institution that, ref that focuses back to the basics, back to the Benedictine basics of living a life of work and prayer. And then that monastery continues to, to grow. O ultimately over 1,500 monasteries throughout Europe would be established with ties to Cluny, the mother house at Cluny. It was a wonderful, wonderful uh, monastery. So our, our time period comes to an end. As I mentioned, the papacy was, had some trouble and some problems in the 8th and 9th century. One little tidbit, the life expectancy of a pope in the 8th and 9th century was a year. Uh, that's not because old men were elected to the papacy. It's because of all the intrigue, political intrigue that was ongoing. We have reports during the 8th and 9th century, 9th and 10th centuries even, of popes who were strangled, murdered uh, by rival claimants and all kinds of horrible things happening during that time period in church history. Again, that's because you have these secular rulers trying to control the church in the West. And ultimately, it's these monks from Cluny who will then engage in this reform of the papacy, which will then make the papacy more independent of secular rulers. And that'll be the story of the church in the next period of time, is growing and becoming more independent from the secular rulers in the West. 
Um, I've enjoyed my time with you here over these last, this last month. Um, I know many of you have went back and frequented the, my, the table with my epic material. I just want to highlight a few things to you. I do have my business card back there. If you have any questions about anything I've presented over this last month or questions on history or whatnot, please do take one of my business cards. You can email me. Um, I guarantee you I will email you back. It might not be 24 hours later, but I will answer the email that you send to me. And I also just wanted to show you that I have a, a little flyer. As I've mentioned before, I do go around the country giving an all-day seminar on church history, and I cover from 33, from the year 33 Pentecost all the way up to the present day in six hours. So it's church history by warp speed. I talk really fast um, <laughs> to cover everything. Uh, but if you're interested in doing that or you want more information about maybe having me come to your parish and being able to do that, or you have friends in other states or other dioceses who might be interested in that, please take a flyer with the information about that and how to, to establish that or set that up uh, and that has all the information on it. I just want to also say that, um, as I think Sabatino mentioned, I do teach church history at the Notre Dame Graduate School of Christendom College in Alexandria, and church history is being offered this fall semester. Uh, so in September of this year, I'll be teaching um, you know, the first half of church history, and then we'll follow it up uh, with the next semester after that. So if you're interested in doing that, you can come to the school. You can audit courses which means you get to sit and, and take in all the wonderful information but not have to write papers. So, uh, and that's less of a cost to you than if you're actually trying to get a degree. So if you're interested in that, please go on our website, www.christendom.edu, and you can find the schedule on how to register and everything for that. So, Sabatino, thank you very much for allowing me to come this last month. Thank you all for being here. I've enjoyed it immensely. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Oh, we're going to take a quick break, three to four minutes, if those that want to stay around for a quick question and answer. Okay, first, before we, before we have our quick question and answer, I um, just want to thank Steve again for a very enlightening program. Thank you. And uh, I highly encourage you to take his... his thank you, thank you. Thank you. Should we have him back? <laughs> okay. All right. That's good. We, Steve's going to come back hopefully back. Uh, in the fall. I always think you know we're going to get there by the fall, but it really ends up being more like spring or summer <laughs> of the next year <laughs> that we actually cycle to that time period. But he's going to be coming back to do the second part of this, which is the church in the second millennium, which will take us up from 1,000 to, to today. I don't know how you could cover yeah, that in four. I'll, I'll talk faster. Well, you did five, yeah. 500 <laughs> 500 years today in one hour. So I mean, yeah, that's right. Anyways, so I'm very thankful for that, and we'll be using Steve in that way as a, as kind of that pole, and then we'll be hanging our other things upon it as we go in and look more deeply at different subjects. Anyways, questions. Where is Clooney? Where is Clooney? In France. France. It's in France. Yeah. And actually, somebody asked me um, just right before the question answer what happened to Clooney, and I mean over. It, it's, yeah, there's, there's still some remnants of it, but the vast majority of the church was actually just, and the, the abbey was destroyed during the French Revolution. So it was one of those, one of those you know, periods of iconoclasm in the West uh, during the French Revolution when revolutionary elements went all throughout France and destroyed all kinds of sacred imagery and, and, and churches and whatnot. And, uh, so they, they tore down a lot of the abbey itself and then used it to, to build other buildings, actually. So. I think I heard uh, something about Irish monks maintaining the learning during the dark ages uh -huh. and passing it on yeah i mean the monk, yeah definitely there were irish you know monks in different monasteries iona was a monastery and and uh you know lindisfarne as well i mean there are different places where these irish and other uh, monks maintained western yeah. civilization by copying all these ancient manuscripts and things like that yeah definitely true you know if you ever have the opportunity there's a great and wonderful program that actually on tv years and years ago in the 60s it's uh if anybody knows of sir kenneth clark he was this british art historian he's, he's done the civil this uh the series called Civilization. It's a fabulous, fabulous. It basically, he's an art historian. He actually converted to Catholicism um, shortly before his death. But he, um, he goes through this whole kind of gamut of European history and Western civilization history by, by taking you to these different places and showing you, uh, you know, Charlemagne's Palace Chapel at Aachen, for example, uh, and, and other t art forms and other work and whatnot. And he goes through and, and tells you the history, basically, of the church and Western civilization by using art. He also has a companion book. If you read it, there's, he's a little too favorable to Luther um, in some areas. This is before he became Catholic. So um, just keep that in mind. But his series is just fantastic. So if you have an opportunity to get that series or go onto Netflix or whatever, definitely, definitely look at that. It's wonderful. Yeah. And he talks about that extensively in there. 
Dr. O'Donnell, by the way, is me coming. He's agreed to come. He normally only agrees to come for one talk, but he's going to have a two-part series with us on the Catholic Church in Ireland uh, leading up to the English invasion, the whole point being that we're going to be looking uh, in the winter to be focusing upon England and what mm -hmm. took place there so that we have the tools necessary to be understanding what's taking place right now between the Anglicans and Rome. And when, uh, when Dr. O'Donnell comes, he's the president of the college at Christendom that, that I teach at, and uh, when he comes, make sure you ask him about the contribution of the Germans during that period of time. <laughs> <laughs> He'll love that. Yes. Thank you, Steve. All right, Grant, thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. God bless. We hope you enjoyed this presentation from the Institute of Catholic Culture. If you'd like to learn more about the mission of the Institute and how you may become a part of this important work, please visit our website at www.instituteofcatholicculture.org or call us at 540-635-7155. And may the glory of Christ Church be ever more manifest upon the earth. St. John the Evangelist. Pray for us.